and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, uh, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Expo Chicago is proud to present the Annual Directors Summit, a program that invites a diverse group of emerging art museum leaders from across the United States for a three-day program addressing the shifting dynamics of museum leadership today. The Directors Summit is centered on two public roundtables on the dialogue stage. A special thank you to our partners, Sotheby's, Bloomberg Connects, the Terra Foundation for American Art, and the University Club of Chicago. It is, I have to say, a great honor to grow this program, now thriving in its third year, uh, by placing focus on an emerging generation of museum leaders, the Director's Summit looks forward with hope. Each of these directors has been in his or her position for under three years, and they are rising in a moment of urgency, yet are playing the long game necessary for structural change. By design, the roundtables bring into the public realm conversations that require a refreshing measure of candor and vulnerability, which centers us on our shared humanity. We will hear today and again tomorrow about their inspiring creative and entrepreneurial initiatives centered on a more equitable future. Given our time constraint of one short hour, I have asked each director to share uh, one initiative that reflects their vision. Following these brief presentations, I will moderate a conversation among them, and I hope to preserve some time at the end to take questions from the audience. So now please allow me to introduce all at once our four panelists. Liz Andrews, PhD, is Executive Director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. Welcome, Liz. <laughs> Vanya Malloy, PhD, Dan uh, Dana Feitler, Director at the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago. Welcome. <laughs> Zoe Ryan, Daniel Dietrich, the second director, Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. And uh, Joanne Northrop, Executive Director and Chief Curator at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art at Johnson County Community College. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And uh, they're going to present in exactly the order that they're introduced. So, Liz, please start. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And thank you so much to the invitation from Joe Snyder and Expo Chicago. And I want to give a shout out to the reason I didn't do this last year, Polaris Lee, the one-year-old, and her Auntie Gabby in the background. This one goes out to her. <laughs> All right, so centering collections care. The Spelman College Museum of Fine Art is at Spelman College, which is a the number one historically black college and university in the country for 17 years running. Spelman College was founded in 1881 for the education of black women. And following that mission, the Spelman College Museum was founded in 1996 with the mission to uplift art by and about women of the African diaspora. So I'm starting here with this image from our last show. We do two shows per year, one for each semester going along with the academic calendar. And this was Harmonio Rosales' Master Narrative. The image you see here is an overturned slave ship suspended from the ceiling. And in the far distance, you can see the words Master Narrative. I love this picture in particular because it visualizes exactly what we are trying to do, turn art history and the master narratives on their head. And in the image, uh, in the right corner, is our president, Helene Gale, who we brought from Chicago, and is um, very supportive of the museum. Next slide, please. So when I arrived at Spelman College, it was pretty deep pandemic. It was August of 2021. You had to get a PCR test to get on campus. And the museum was closed for two full years. We reopened with a collection show that I used as the opportunity to learn about the collection at Spelman. We have about 450 artworks. 
and the show is entitled Silver Linings. And it's really an art history 101 from an African American perspective with works by male and female artists going back to 1912 all the way up to today. And what's beautiful about this show is it, it celebrated the silver 25th anniversary of the museum, but it's also now on national tour. It is the first time that Spelman College has ever organized and toured a national exhibition, and we are doing that in partnership with the Art Bridges Foundation. It's currently in Boise, Idaho. And so people around the country now are going to learn about the fact that many artists who were actively excluded during their lifetimes from being exhibited and collected at major and encyclopedic museums, they have always been celebrated and um, and propped up at places like Spelman, as well as Fisk and Tuskegee and Clark Atlanta and Howard University and talking here about the HBCUs. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to work on this collection and I'll say it's a win-win because there's 40 works in the show that are no longer in storage at the moment. So we have the room to, and space to rethink things. Next slide. I came from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA, and I uh, co-curated a show there called Black American Portraits, a collection show for LACMA. And we did that in conjunction with the Obama portraits because we wanted to provide some context. These portraits didn't just arise out of nowhere. There's a deep, long history of Black Americans using portraiture as a tool of power. And that show had 140 works and 70 of them were new acquisitions for LACMA. So it wasn't just a exhibition that went on for a few months, it's something that has literally changed the face of the collection. So we traveled to Spelman College and you'll see on the left hand side here, there's a work by Augusta Savage that is, um, it looks like it's bronze, but it's actually painted plaster. She's a Harlem Renaissance artist and this is a co-acquisition for Spelman. So it was a LACMA collection show, but we used the opportunity of that show to acquire new works in partnership with the Terra Foundation for American Art, shout out to Chicago, right here. And um, this is one piece that we co-acquired and another one I'll show you at the end. Next slide. This is from that same show I showed you earlier, Harmonia Rosales, Master Narrative. And on the far left is a painting of the Orisha or African deity Oshun, um, a very powerful woman who is the patron of the arts and humanities, love. And we are currently acquiring this work. So making sure that we use every exhibition as an opportunity to collect. Next slide. And then we have a collection spun show up right now called Threaded, which shows works by black women working in textiles. There's seven quilts from our permanent collection from G's Bend, as well as works by Lisa Butler, Ebony Patterson, um, Phyllis Stevens on view. And I want to show this image in particular because it shows one of our conservation workshops. So one of the first things I did when I came to Spelman was gasp at the state of the collection, as I think everybody does, and created a new position of collections manager. So in the left-hand side, you see our collections manager, Shannon Kimbrough, with a group of students talking about the conservation of these quilts. She's showing the batting and the ways that um, we had to have these quilts treated in order to get them exhibition ready and also to care for them for generations to come. And then on the right, we have a picture of, from social media from the AUC Art Collective, which is a very powerful undergraduate degree in art history and curatorial studies that is training the next generation of curators, museum directors, and leaders. Next slide. And finally, I want to show this image, which is called Thy Name We Praise. This was a commissioned co-acquisition with the Terra Foundation by Kalita Rawls. 
It may look like a photograph, but it's acrylic paint. She's famous for um, these images of black people in water. And this one is especially Spellman because it's a white dress and blue. And if you know Spellman well, it's the first line of the Spellman hymn, Thy Name We Praise. So the things that we're doing at Spellman are caring for the collection, growing the collection, and training the next generation of collection care leaders. Thank you. Yes, it's my turn. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Vanya Malloy. I'm the Dana Feitler Director of the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago. And it's an honor to be here with all of you today. And thank you to so many of our smart staff who are here to represent. I'm so grateful. Um, you know, it was a big question to say, what should I speak about an initiative or an area of that, what I feel that we need to address at the SMART? Because I think there's many more than one answers. But I think one that's come to my mind as someone who's worked most of my career at different academic museums is the student body. We have many audiences we serve. But as an academic museum, students are central to our mission as well. And so one of the questions I've had is how do we reach all of our students? Um, you know, as a goal, we would want all students to say they've been to the art museum, they participated. It was part of their a core part of their student experience. And I don't think any one approach will reach everybody. You have to have multiple approaches. Um, but what I observed in, I worked at Amherst College, I worked at Syracuse University Art Museum, I worked at many institutions, and I've spoken to lots of students, I've done surveys, and same, you know, spoken to students at the University of Chicago. And what I observed is this younger generation, half of them say, I've never been to an art museum. Full stop. Never. And so you can imagine they come to the university and they're studying biotech. They're studying, they want to do law. They want to do something else. They're not art history. And they walk right by the art museum. They walk right by it, walk to something else, keep walking by it. How do you get them to come in? And so that's something I've been thinking about for years and something that you know is really passionate for me as well because I was a pre-med student and it was by accident I found my way to an art history class and look where I am now. Uh, probably what every parent does not want to hear because they're like. <laughs> um, so you know there's so much many of us probably here already know this that students can gain from access to an art museum and you know critical thinking as one seeing the museum as a place for dialogue understanding the significance of culture seeing your place within that culture um, it's so important and i think it's an experience that when they graduate they take it wherever they go um, and it's an appreciation for the arts that i think is a, a big gift that we're giving to everyone who participates so how do we make this happen it, the Smart Museum has actually been a leader in many ways in this way. So, you know, we do many different things. We have the Art to Live With program where students camp out and set up for basketball tickets. They're doing it for art that they get to put in their dorm and they live there for a year, uh, live with the art for the year. And, but the biggest one, the most effective one, is actually curricular engagement. When their professor says, you're coming to the museum for class, they're going to come. And then it opens the door, they get to know it, and they decide if they want to come back for a program or event later on. And we've done a great deal in this area, especially with the Mellon Initiative. So next slide, please. Um, and the Mellon Initiative really thought about looking at our collection and looking at how we can teach with faculty across, especially the humanities. So in the early 90s, the, the SMART got funding from Mellon to create positions that support teaching across the humanities. And this was transformational because it meant instead of our history and visual arts being the main users of the collection, which as you see here spans the entire globe from antiquity to present day, um, it, it actually uh, allowed us to build these bridges with people teaching religion or history or other areas of the humanities. Um, and this is you know, a skill set that not every faculty member had, how do you teach with an object, but it allowed us to build a lot of bridges and me meant that a lot of more students were actually taking classes at the museum. But as we look now, next slide please, um, so you can see students in study rooms taking classes and so forth. But what's happening now is, you know, that's still not the whole audience. And humanities, as many of us know, that there's an under-enrollment in humanities that's happening today. So how do you keep the museum relevant to all students? How do you reach the students who 
aren't already coming to the museum for classes or self-selecting to come. And so one area that I've been really interested in is the sciences, STEM. My PhD actually looked at the intersection of modern science and modern art, and I think art is inherently incredibly interdisciplinary. Next slide, please. And so an opportunity came up to experiment, to try something different, and to see how it would work or not. And that was an acquisition by this, or the, this collective team lab, which is a Japanese collective of artists uh, that includes artists, scientists, um, computer scientists, uh, mathematicians, architects that work together and create these really immersive artworks that are digital. Next slide, please. And if you hit play, hopefully it'll work, you'll see this is the work we acquired ever blossoming life. And the work itself actually continues to move. It's changing. It's on a digital screen. And you think it's like on a loop and it's repeating. It's not. It's a computer algorithm. That means it never changes. It continues to be different. And what, the way we came to acquire this work was actually the dean of the physical sciences school at the University of Chicago and the dean of the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering saw it and were like, oh my god, this is amazing. And this is amazing because it uses computer science and there's a lot of technology in it. They've also created it in a way that you can't duplicate it, so there's all this technology and science behind that. But then also it's amazing because it's a collective of artists and scientists working together. And what, is that, what does that open up for us in terms of other ideas like climate change? What are some ways that we can work together? And so that, that to me was the most exciting thing about this opportunity. The last thing I want to say about it is it also opened up where we put art. Because this is a work that isn't just, um, go back to the last slide so people can look at that. Um, it, it isn't just uh, something that stays and it has to be preserved perfectly. It's on a computer screen, and the actual digital file can, is held with the artist collective. We have a copy of it. So if it's destroyed, it can be replaced. So that means we can put it in a lobby. What we did is we actually put it in the lobby of a science building right next to where students go to a huge auditorium for lectures. So hundreds of students walk by it every day and get to experience it. And then the, you know, the QR code and the label next to it reference them back to the SMART. So it's a way we're experimenting with new media to see how we can reach a wider audience. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, many thanks to Jill um, and the wonderful Expo team for this opportunity to be part of such an esteemed panel. Um, and it's wonderful to be back in Chicago, my old stomping ground. I see a lot of past and present um, Art Institute people. Big shout out to you all. Um, I am the director of the ICA in Philadelphia, and for those not familiar with the ICA, and we can go to the next slide, we are a contemporary art center. We were founded in 1963 um, at the University of Pennsylvania. We are in Philly. Um, and from the start, ICA has been a place of radical experimentation. Um, we have become known for really launching the careers of artists like long before they became become household names. And if you show the next slide, I know it's hard to think of Andy Warhol and Clifford Still as lesser known artists, um, but at one time, you know, they got their start at ICA, and in, in the 60s, they had their first solo shows at ICA. If you look at the next slide, you'll see our current season really builds on this history. We take pride today in being a launch pad for contemporary art and ideas and a place of possibility. And you see that through the work of Tomashi Jackson, Dominic White, Alberta Whipple, and this fantastic um, installation on our facade by Nonsi Gilelo Mutiti. So I've been at ICA for three years now, and we have taken time and made space for sort of really reflecting and planning. Um, and in 2021, I secured a Pew grant from Arts and Heritage, big shout out to Pew, um, that allowed us to do a strategic visioning process. And this was very important for me. I started, like um, my colleagues, in the middle of the pandemic. So it was the wake of the pandemic, um, also during the social uprisings that were heightened after the murder of George Floyd. And I really wanted to get a sense of where was ICA in all of this? Like, what did people think about ICA? Um, with the feedback that we received, it was really clear. The program was very strong. Artists felt very supported, which, of course, is, is the, the primary goal um, for any of our work. 
Um, and there was an opportunity and an appetite from within the organization and outside of the organization for us to lean more into our role as a convener, as a resource for our communities, but also to think much more experimentally about how we approach learning, just as Vanya um, noted. And learning became like this core um, core value for us as we move forward. So I thought that I would start with uh, talking about this, seeing as that we're all from academic institutions. So this is my case study. So the findings of the strategic visioning process enabled me to do a couple of things. And one was really important. I repositioned and recentered public engagement and expanded it through public engagement and, and research. And I was able to hire a director for that team, Rachel Murillo, who is really my thought partner in this work. And we now define learning at ICA in a couple of ways. So as knowledge production in the kind of academic sense, but also as lifelong learning. So learning that happens within, alongside, and outside of those more formal spaces. And if you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to use the case study of a recent exhibition um, with David Antonio Cruz to illustrate how we are really building um, around our program been in extension building our communities at ICA. And a great example was this exhibition um, that was on recently. David Antonio Cruz is a North Philly native. Um, the guest curator of the show, Monique Long, was from, is from North Philly. And many of the sitters the in the paintings were from Philly, hence the title, When the Children Come Home. And this was an exhibition honoring chosen family. You can go to the next slide, please. So we kicked off um, the kind of the opening celebration for this exhibition um, with, a, with a party. And we do, we do parties very well at ICA, I would say, um, highlighting some of the underlying themes. So we worked with Los Bamberos, um, who came in and did um, Puerto Rican folk dance um, as part of that. And we also had live music and dancing. And I jest, but actually, dance parties combined with other educational elements are our standards for how we um, sort of approach our opening celebrations. And these are one of the most joyful times at ICA. We see 500 to 1,000 people at ICA enjoying themselves. And of course, then I enjoy myself because uh, um, I, 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 you know, there's nothing greater than a director seeing sort of the community coming together and really showing up for, for ICA. So in addition to the more sort of traditional artist talks and presentations that David Antoni did participate in, and of course, we're really well known for, um, we also did a couple of other things. We supported David in creating a performance, uh, the first performance he'd ever had in a gallery with his paintings. And ICA is really known for commissioning and working very closely with artists on projects. Um, and then we had a very moving and poignant program towards the end of the show, which was the Family Photo Day, where actually it was Family Photo Weekend, where visitors could sign up and almost step into a David Antonio Cruz photo. Um, he was there taking your family portrait, your chosen family portrait, as you can see at the top. And it was very, very popular, as you can imagine. Finally, for the first time in ICA's history, we piloted a program for school children. And this is not something that ICA has really focused deeply on. We've really been about adult education. Um, however, our audiences, we see, are increasingly multi-generational. Um, and this was an opportunity for us to partner with a really important organization in Philly, Taer um, Puerto Riqueño, which is an organization in Kensington, one of the most under-resourced neighborhoods in Philly. Um, and this is an organization really committed to and dedicated to our Puerto Rican arts and heritage. Um, and I'm going to run the next slide, which is the video. David Antonio Cruz was in the after-school program at Taer. He then went back to teach there. So this was a great opportunity for, for us to bring students to ICA, many of whom had never been to an art center or, or a museum. So to realize this program, though, we had to think through a lot of ac access issues and barriers to entry. Number one, transportation, so chartering buses. Um, we also coordinated one-on-one -on -one time, as you're seeing with David Antonio, where he got to meet students and talk to them about what it was to be an artist and also someone that grew up where they, where they live. And I think it was very, also very inspiring to see students being able to participate holistically. Many of these kids are recent immigrants. English is not their first language, so we made a commitment to bilingual, bilingual labels. 
but also bilingual programming. And this is something now that we're, we've made a real commitment to and they could really fully participate in the exhibition. So as we finalize the goals and the priorities um, of our now strategic direction for the next one to three years and beyond, this programming has really made us understand what makes ICA unique. And it's really about supporting artists, but also being really audience focused. Um, and understanding what staffing, budgeting, skills, and partnerships are necessary, but will be co-beneficial. So beneficial to us, but also really beneficial to the partners that we're working with. So that we can continue to sort of strengthen our impact with audiences further, how we support artists, and really live our values as, as a launch pad for, for art and ideas. So it is a very exciting time at ICA, and you can go to the last slide. And I look forward to welcoming you all um, to Philadelphia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Jill and the Expo staff, um, Tony, Kate, Megan. Everyone has been incredibly welcoming and kind, and we all appreciate it. Um, in August 2021, I was appointed executive director and chief curator of the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art on the campus of Johnson County Community College in Oberlin Park, Kansas. When people hear the words art museum in Kansas at a community college, this might be the image that comes to mind. <laughs> However, <laughs> next slide. This is the reality. The 41,000 square foot building opened in 2007 and was designed by Kyusung Wu Architects. The collection includes approximately 2,000 artworks from 1980 to the present. 400 of these artworks are displayed across campus outside the Nerman Museum in hallways across campus and outdoors integrating contemporary art into the lives of the 20,000 plus students at Johnson County Community College. The permanent collection includes major works by Catherine Bradford, Nick Cave, Jeffrey Gibson, Carrie James Marshall, Elizabeth Murray, Angel Otero, Wendy Redstar, Dana Schutz, Roger Shimamura, Allison Sholnick, Dohosa, Leo Villarreal, Kihen Day Wiley, and others. The Nerman Museum has been committed to presenting and collecting the vanguard of contemporary art since its founding as the JCCC Art Gallery in 1990. Artists that had their first solo institutional exhibitions at the Nerman Museum include Dana Schutz, Ebony G. Patterson, and Lauren Quinn. When I started at the Nerman Museum and began to introduce myself to the cultural community, I was struck by the fact that the Nerman Museum was consistently referred to as a hidden jewel. This description was used so frequently that it raised questions. With a stellar building and a, an amazing and diverse collection, why did the Nerman museum stay off people's radar. I sought the advice of colleagues, mentors, and experts in the field. And what followed was a wise pivot, a reinvention of the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. We focused first on building our future vision and creating the museum's first strategic plan. We revised and updated the org chart and added the position of community relations manager and we built new relationships to strengthen our position in the regional arts ecosystem through robust collaborations. So my new initiative was to bring major performance artists to Kansas City to attract and engage cultural partners. In fall 2022, we hosted Danae artist Raven Chacon, and in 2023, we hosted Vanessa German. This has been a successful new initiative, but not without its challenges and risks. 
Um, last spring, we hosted performance artist duo Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens. Next slide. Sprinkle and Stevens have been life partners and 50-50 collaborators on multimedia projects since 2002. They are authors of the Ecosex Manifesto and producers of the award-winning films Goodbye Gully Mountain and Water Makes Us Wet. A documentary feature that premiered at Documenta 14 and was screened at MoMA in New York. Sprinkle is a former sex worker with a PhD in human sexuality, and Stevens holds a PhD in performance studies and is founding director of the Earth Lab at UC Santa Cruz. The outcome was that we gained greater visibility among the Vanguard contemporary art world. We earned a positive reputation which helped us to attract the next performance artist duo that came to the museum, Guillermo Gomez Pena and Balatronica Gomez. Even more importantly, we learned how to push the envelope with the college administration as far as we could up to the line, but not over. I emailed a summary of my plans for the Sprinkle Stevens collaboration to the director of the college's sustainability program. And I guess this would be a great idea to cross promote on the event. I guessed wrong. Um, perhaps the Prairie wasn't ready for it. Um, then I called a meeting with the vice president to whom I report and included our public programs and community relations managers. We pitched the idea of hosting Annie and Beth on campus for a series of programs. She supported our vision, but suggested that we could tap into private funds and perhaps hold some programs off-site. This would protect the college and the museum, just in case any taxpayers disagreed with using their tax dollars for such programs. Next slide, please. We decided to have a Nerman Museum public program, but it would be held, held off-site in nature. The resulting prairie walk was robust and well attended, and we had a biologist on hand to answer questions about the flora and fauna. And Annie and Beth loved visiting the prairie for the first time. The rest of the tour was rich in collaborations and partnerships. We had a storytelling night at Inner Urban Art House, a book signing and screening at the Nelson Atkins, a lecture for first year undergraduate students at the Kansas City Art Institute, a public talk with artist Miller and Schellebarger at the Spencer Museum, University of Kansas. And, next slide please, Glamma. The mission of Glamma is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the materials that reflect the histories of the LGBTQIA communities of the Kansas City region. We now have an ongoing relationship with Glamma and have collaborated on programs together. And in the future, Beth Stevens plans to do a project with the archive. The Nerman Museum of Contemporary Arts former status as a hidden jewel is well on its way to being eclipsed. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, your initiatives are so interesting, and I think one of the things to me that uh, now, you know, doing this program for years is how institutionally specific each of these initiatives that draw upon the specificity. You, know, you are all academic museums, but look at how each of you have come into your institutions at different points of time in their history and their development and very, um, in very, I think, innovative ways figured out a hook or a way in which to release resources and to broaden an engagement. So I really applaud you for all that. Um, I think, Joanne, your uh, compelling story, which I just love, um, kind of opens up a, a broader question about being in a moment of time, uh, a, a rather volatile environment for freedom of expression. And I know from talking to you, Zoe, and, um, and also um, Vanya, 
that it isn't just art, as we know, many of us in the art world, being environments of, of high degree of turbulence, but the broader academic community. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what it is, how you navigate your academic and uh, university environments around the topic of pre, uh, about, the, about pre freedom of expression, where, as you said, where do you, where are the lines? Is there, are there processes of self-censoring that you struggle with? as you are developing your, your programs and your initiatives. And um, I just, I would love to hear from each of you, but whoever wants to respond, please feel free. Um, actually, Jill told us that we were forbidden to give one word answers, so I would have said, carefully. <laughs> Do you wanna go? Your turn. I'll, I'll take the mic. Um, we are very fortunate um, at Penn that they are steadfast in freedom of expression. And uh, uh, you can see what is, uh, if anybody's been reading the news at, at Penn, obviously it's been a very challenging time over the last few months. We are very fortunate at ICA that um, in our founding charter in 1963, it said ICA must be a place that takes risks. Um, and of course, you know, there are many, many ways in which we, we take risks. But at the very core of ICA, um, we're often working with artists who have not had um, either a gallery representation, aren't working, you know, with museums, don't have the experience of that. So, so there's lots of risks we take in, in terms of the artists that we choose to work with. Our goal is really to support those under-recognized voices and ideas and lift them up. So much of the work that we do is sort of two things. One is working with artists on a lot of professional developments. What is a registrar? What is a loan form? Um, Hallie Ringel, who's here with me, is our chief curator, is absolutely committed, dedicated, as we are, to, to this work. And it's very fulfilling. Um, our goal is to really help artists, you know, have a show at ICA, but then obviously, you know, go into the world and do, do great things. I think the other thing is, is that we are, um, I think one of the positives of the last period is how important places like ICA and, and all of our institutions have become as places where you can come and have conversations around difficult issues. Our projects deal with all the most pressing issues of our time through the lens of art. We have a 45 member strong student board. We're constantly in dialogue you know, with, our, um, with our various constituents. And I was very pleased um, during this period where our board chair was very supportive and sort of um, sort of absolutely buyed into the idea that, and, and kept repeating it back to me, Zoe, we are the place that can bring people around our shared humanity and be the place to have um, challenging conversations. And that was very important over the last, last period. But I think it's very, yeah, maybe it's different in our different organizations. I would agree, Zoe, that Similarly, University of Chicago really stands for free expression. And as many of you pro probably heard, the Chicago principles, which have now been widely adopted by other institutions. There's some nuance to that, that we as our staff have, oh have experienced, which is more, we are a place where we can invite artists, invite scholars for free expression. But the staff, you know, we, we are not in a place where we can like create our own statements about our personal beliefs and share them. So there, there is a little bit of a, a nuance in terms of how we exemplify free expression, but we are much more protected than many of our peers. And that's something that has become really apparent in the conversations we've had as staff with other colleagues in other states and other places, especially in Florida, where we realize how lucky we are. We realize that we don't have to fear a show is gonna be canceled or a speaker will be canceled or will be punished for something like that. that would not happen, and we feel confidently about that. And that's not true for many places in our country. Uh, I'd like to push a little more into this conversation, again, since so many of you touched on engagement with audiences and trying to really broaden the envelope, in your case, uh, uh, students um, and through the collection and through the really broadening your uh, audience. How, what, can you 
provide a little bit more um, examples of misperceptions and how you've navigated. What are these misperceptions? Are, are they prevalent? Is there a through line? How are people perceiving art? And how do you, as directors leading the institutions, um, meet them where they are? And, and what strategies do you use? I think for Spelman College Museum, the misperception about the museum is that it's not open to the public. So we've done a lot to just get the word out there that we're free and we're inviting because it, it can be intimidating to walk up to the gates of Spelman College and, and it's a pretty closed and insular and special environment. So making sure that people know that we're there and um, I appreciate some of my colleagues here talking about the engagement with the curriculum because Every first year Spelman student takes a year long course called uh, African Diaspora in the World and they have to come to the museum twice and write about the exhibition or a work of art. And so I think being at a culturally specific institution, it is especially important to empower our students, which is you know our primary audience, to know that they belong in museums. Because I think that a lot of the time, at least uh, especially pre-2020, there uh, has been a feeling, rightfully so, among many that museums are fancy places for people who are not like me. And so I would say there's a misperception of what museums can be and you know, they, they are rooted in colonialism. There is, a, there is a history there. But what they can do for the future and who can belong and who can be leaders, I think that's what we're really trying to change. Um, I would say that um, one of the best things that the Nerman Museum does is something I referred to before, and that is that we really share our collection. Um, most museums have a two or three percent of their collection on view at any given time. We have about 25 percent, um, whether that's in the museum itself or out in the hallways across campus. And the reason why that's really important is that we are a non-residential community college. A lot of people come to JCCC to, to transfer to a four-year university, but some of them come to get a certificate in nursing at the Culinary Institute, welding, plumbing, all kinds of professions that, truth be told, make more than art historians. So <laughs> I'm all for that. Um, but what I love is that if there is a student who, and we have students like this, an immigrant with three jobs that's taking class at night, they're still gonna experience art because it's in the hallways. And I feel like that has a way of filtering down and entering people's consciousness, whether or not they know it, whether or not they read the didactic material. And um, that's just a beautiful thing. I think um, Brooke touched on this. I think one of the most important things about ICA is our commitment to being free and free for everything, dance parties included. Um, but it's, it's, you know, that releases the barrier. That does not mean that everybody understands that. You know, people still think you have to have your kind of pen um, badge to get in the door. Um, but it's a terrific starting point. And I love nothing more. My office um, overlooks our terrace. And I love nothing more than seeing students kind of creeping into the building, going onto the terrace and plugging in because we have plugs outside and using our spaces, you know, as a way to study, a place to study or kind of gather with their friends. And we're really hoping to do, to do more of that. I think one of the things that I'm so surprised by at Penn, um, which is a very specific um, university, is just where art shows up. So of course it shows up in the MFA program, in, in um, art history, in the School of Arts and Sciences, but the amount of art that is in presentations at the Wharton Business School 
or kind of the taking design thinking or other kind of creative modeling tools. And I have professors coming over to show me their PowerPoints because they've heard me talking about how many students at Wharton are taking a minor in art history is really incredible. And I think our job is to really leverage that um, ac across the university um, because art really shows up in, 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 in many places. And this idea of, especially with the, uh, with the business school, the idea of taking risks in a calculated way or thinking expansively about financial modeling. I mean, obviously, they're, they're really learning something from, from working with art. Um, for us, I think developing the student board has been really fantastic. I mean, 45 members is, is, you know, that is a big group going out there on campus and students bring students. Um, and I think that that has been really important for us. And I'll go back to the dance parties. I think it's also the types of activities. I mean, it's not just the students who are solely wanting academic um, types of programming. They love that too, but they are really wanting to be makers. And we've seen this, especially in the last few years during the pandemic, the amount of hands-on type of art making um, that students want to do is, is incredible. They love those kinds of activities. And tonight at ICA, um, the students are taking over the entire building. They do their own programming. They get to have work experience at ICA, but they also have their own dance parties. So tonight with my staff there, um, they're taking over the whole of ICA. And for me, that's a very important message that they have agency and, and they can get to do their own programming, not programming that's ju just directed by us. And I think that signals something very differently to the, to the student body. Absolutely, and I would agree with that. I mean, one of the things I think about is how museums build community. They bring people and students together, but they also, in any given moment, you'll see the community for us, South Side community of Chicago, together in the galleries with students, with faculty, with people, staff who are taking a lunch break. And there's opportunities for, for to be able to engage with one another, to have dialogue, to challenge each other, to have conversation around art. And that to me is so rewarding and why it's so important to have an in-person museum. One of the biggest, in answer to your question, Jill, what do I see as one of the mis bigger misconceptions or things we're struggling with is relevance. I think everyone now is like, well, I can pull it up on my phone. Why do I have to go all the way over to the museum? And I think it's one, it's never the same on your phone, I'll tell you that. But two, it's because of the, the, the environment of being together in a space in front of an object and seeing who's there and then having a conversation. You can't have that experience on your phone. And that's why I think the muse museum is so important. And it could, you know, art museum in an academic space creates a really unique environment that is incredibly special. Ask you one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. And so this is waving your magic wand. I think of resources, you know, I think of a museum director's job is that we we channel resources. And I think broadly about resources as people, time, money, objects. So I would love to hear from you, and you know, if you would wave your magic wand, what, what resources do you, do you desire, do you need, would you most, would you prioritize? Money? <laughs> yeah, I second that emotion. Yeah. I mean, I think when you rely on your parent institution for part of your budget, it's a huge vulnerability. And so I think like financial stability is really important. And that's what I would, that would be my first vote. Yeah, I agree. I think that being able to have um, consistent funding, because I don't know what the situations are at your institutions, but I bring in a lot of the funds with grants and individual gifts and probably 90% of the money that we spend on program and collection comes from outside institutions. But you never know if that two-year grant is going to be renewed, you know? So I think that having sustainable funding sources and then the thing that, that pops into my head aside from money specifically is I would really love to have a... Um, Spelman College Museum has never published a uh, book about the collection, and that's a major goal. 
So thinking through, um, you know, all the ins and outs of a project like that. We've got the, you know, collection of photography and inventory and all of that, working on that, but what does it really take to, you know, edit a book and invite scholars and all for a collection book that you want to stay evergreen that's about a museum with a, such a specific mission around women of the Afro diaspora. So I'd love, um, I'd love some inspiration and um, funding and people to bounce ideas off of for a project, a publishing project. Um, I guess that I'm really taking you seriously about the magic wand, like it's magic, right? So um, my museum is in a suburb of Kansas City and you have to reach it by bus or car. I would love for it to be more accessible, more centrally located so that people could walk into it um, because that is, that is to me an issue um, with visitorship. One of the biggest misperceptions, especially being at an Ivy League, is that we get all the money. You know, the money all comes from the Ivy. Well, that is absolutely not the case. Um, we have a 5.6 operating budget, two thirds of that we raise annually. So I think, you know, that is, that is a real misperception. Um, and of course, yeah, financially, we, I think, you know, ICA is the, one of the reasons why I wanted to come from the Art Institute of Chicago to the ICA is to really test out, can an institution of that size and scale be really nimble? And we can, you know, we pivot quite quickly, we test things out, we're all about experimentation, but that also takes resources. Um, and I think one of the things that we're grappling with is what are the thing, what are the skills we need in house and what are the skills we need out of house? Because as the audience sort of gets shaped and, and we build our communities and we get more, I think, really excited about doing projects out of the walls of, of ICA, um, projects that will be very meaningful, for example, to other, um, other neighborhoods of Philly. We are in the poorest big city in the States and we often feel that, even though we're at Penn, which is of course a, a juggernaut. Um, but I think being able to yeah, have the resources to go beyond the walls. And then as, as I, I take very seriously my, my role as a steward, that I am just caring for and, and keeping ICA together, and then I will hand it off to the, sort of the, the next person, like pass the baton. And I think to Brooke's point, for us, um, the history of ICA is so robust um, and incredible, and I would love for us to be able to tell those stories more from 1963. And when you talked about like the challenges, I, I think of the 1988 show um, with Robert Maplethorpe that was so controversial and, and created such dialogue in the art world. It'd be wonderful to be able to talk about those stories because it's not, it's not just now that we're facing challenges. These are deep-rooted challenges that have, that have long histories. And it'd be wonderful to show how an art organization like the ICA has been able to have an impact in, in those stories. Uh, thank you, and I'm gonna open it up, but I, I, I'd like to just summarize something that I think is one of the paradoxes of small to mid-sized contemporary museums, especially with frequent programming, that there is, um, that one, there is um, perhaps a greater uh, capability to raise for programs, special exhibitions or special initiatives, but in f actual fact, to be as, uh, to achieve what you do best, which is this nimbleness, and to be able to take risks, you need to be capitalized in a way that gives you the, sta the, the sustainability that Liz is talking about to be able to take those leaps, which you know, may have failure or may not bring an audience or you know, that may use resources in a way that doesn't seem as, as efficient. But you can't do that if your, your underlying operational costs are not really a bedrock and so I, I'm a big proponent, anyone that's out there is a funder, <laughs> general operating support, uh, su endowment, things that provide that kind of foundational support which allows you to be the risk takers that you are. So I applaud you for all that. 
And let me open it up. We have about five minutes to see if there are questions from the audience. And I think there's a, a mic you want to give. Uh, as an emerging museum my professional myself, what's one piece of advice you can share with me that I can carry into my studies and, excuse me, career? I can go first. I would say, hmm. I, so I've worked almost every museum role there is in different capacities. I mean, I was an assistant to a registrar. I um, did the front desk and visitor services. I've worked in other parts of the museum. Or I even like worked in conservation for one summer. And I think that's helped me a lot to understand the work of my colleagues, to understand what the museum needs to operate. And it's given me a wider perspective. I've also worked at an auction house. I've worked at a gallery. And it kind of has given me a wider perspective. And I do think that's beneficial. So especially as if you're a student and you're doing studies and you have the opportunities to do it, I would encourage you to. I love the blue and yellow, our neighbors from, uh, from Drexel. Um, it's a really great question. Oh my goodness, I could, I could have many things, but I think one of the things that I value enormously is mentorship. And I think people think that mentors sort of some, somehow float down on a cloud and uh, appear um, but sometimes you seek them out. You know, you really, if you're really interested in, in, in certain things or um, certain directions or pathways, it's really having, you know, great, great mentors, people that you can call up about a variety of things. And I know one of the goals of this cohort, for example, the, the leadership um, summit was really about that. And us all having people on kind of what used to be called speed dial so we could uh, call one another and, and really talk about the things that are that are challenging because we know the world moves fast. Museums don't always move that fast, but they're 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 you know they're they're jogging right now. They might not be you know sprinting, but we we do have to move much more quickly. And you're making decisions all the time that have great impacts on the institution. So having other great people to sort of bounce ideas off of is fantastic. Any other questions? Um, it's not really a question, it's more of just a general statement that I hope you guys take with you back to your field. Um, I see a lot of gaps in the programs that are accessible for the average American. You know, you talk about how art is a luxury. The average American can think about art. So I hope that like in the future there's more partnerships and programs for the average American to have the luxury to think about art. <laughs> Sorry if that kind of went in a circle. Um, yeah, just there's a lot there. You know, there's a lot of focus towards teens and seniors, but you know, your local tradesman, you know, he might be a welder. He doesn't have the luxury to think about art and just the con consciousness of it, he doesn't know. Or he may not think about it because what he's doing is a skill. So um, maybe in the future, if you guys want a partnership with your local trade or union, I think you could find something there. Thank you. I think there was one more question. Yes, over here. My name is Share. Um, I actually like to piggyback and add a question to what she mentioned, which is how do you all as museum directors balance and hold the responsibility of being policy or public administration professionals with what you do within museums as um, career art professionals, I'd say. Thank you. I think that we're in a very privileged position in that um, there have been studies showing that regardless of race, economic status, people, for some reason, trust museums. And so I think also to answer your question in the yellow shirt about what to do when you're thinking about going forward in your career, 
is to remember that um, you're probably not getting into it for the money. So you must love the fact that this is a space for education. This is a space for um, anyone, theoretically, to be able to show up and to learn something. So for example, our current exhibition shows quilts from G's Bend and the women from G's Bend, Alabama never meant for these quilts to be on view. These are practical pieces that you use to keep your loved ones warm. And I've heard so many people come into the museum and say, my grandmother made quilts like that. This is something that I've only, never thought of as art before. So I think finding the uh, points of entry where people can relate and conveying that information and really holding dear the mission to be a, a space of convening, a space where you're not gonna just be able to experience it on your phone. You're going to be able to interact with people and see objects and hopefully learn something and be inspired in a way that you wouldn't be otherwise. So I think it's it's very important and it's very it's extremely important to me to remember that we are here for the public. We're here because we are supposed to be a space that reflects and inspires the communities we serve. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming and please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you.